Hello, everyone. My name is Adam Corker, and I'm the founder and the CEO of the AB Corker Foundation for Mental Health. It's good to see you again. Uh, this is a, uh, a, a, a part of our uh, Wednesday webinars, and it, it, the topic today is really centered around how physical activity and mental health really intertwine. As you know, our foundation is really founded on the principles that those two are interconnected and intertwined. And that's why, you know, our flagship event is a 55050, which is a 5K run in all 50 states in 50 days, uh, run or walk, to really promote our message of unity between those two elements in our body. Well, today we're really honored and pleased to introduce to you uh, someone who really found uh, through their passion, uh, uh, a, a source of help to their mental health by something different than running an exercise, uh, than running or walking in the form of exercise, but rather weightlifting and, and uh, bodybuilding. Well, I'm really pleased to introduce to you Christina Leonetti. Uh, Christina is a competitive power lifter and she is the founder and the CEO of a, an amazing organization called Pull Your Heart. Well, uh, Christina, can you? Uh... Here she is. Hello, doctor. <laughs> Hello, Christina, again. Uh, I was just uh, talking a little bit about who we are as a foundation. Uh, you know, as you know, I think you and I have had some earlier conversations about this, that our foundation is centered about physical activity and mental health and how the two of them are intertwined and how, you know, good body and good mind really sort of really connect quite well with each other. Uh, I wanted you to introduce yourself to me and tell me a little bit more about what you do and how you end up getting to establish the <laughs> Um, my name is Christina Leonati, and I am the founder and president of Pull Your Heart Out. Uh, we are a 501c3 nonprofit organization um, founded to uh, promote strength sports as a way of dealing with trauma. So um, personally, I came to creating the organization uh, after you know, myself, I found powerlifting um, a very long road. I started lifting in my early 40s um, after uh, I had a very severe stalking case, which led to uh, a lot of PTSD for me, led me to being hospitalized. I just, con I just stopped eating altogether. I think at one point I was down to about 105 pounds, where now I weigh about 140. So that's a pretty big difference on my build. Um, but I. But you're all muscle, though. <laughs> <laughs> well, mostly muscle. <laughs> um, but uh, so I started lifting. Actually, I was a case manager for at risk youth at the time, and I had a student who was dealing with addiction. And we were having a conversation in my office one day, uh, just sort of like a back and forth, how hard it is to deal with addiction. And he casually mentioned or asked me, what's something that I've always wanted to do that I felt like was going to need a lot of willpower. And you know, I said, I've always admired women who were very physically strong and muscular, um, I've always, been interested in pursuing that, but it's scary. Um, and he said, I will get off drugs if you do a bodybuilding competition. And the rest is history. <laughs> so, wow. so I did do the bodybuilding competition. Um, and it changed my life. Like through that process, I sort of found this thing that I didn't realize I needed, which was lifting weights, which helped me deal with my stress. And um, from there, uh, I started, I moved to Colorado and I uh, found a powerlifting community, which was also very intriguing to me because unlike bodybuilding, powerlifting, powerlifting didn't have the aesthetic 
um, you know, like you have to look a certain way in bodybuilding, which can also be very mentally challenging, uh, especially for women, but also men. Uh, so you kind of are trying to build this physique and you start to at one point kind of nitpick yourself. So I found in power, I went to a powerlifting competition and there was every shape and size of person there competing. And there was no, there was no right or wrong as to, as to what you looked like. And I found that very intriguing. And there were amazing people just lifting these crazy amounts of weights that I couldn't even fathom at the time that I would be able to do. Um, so I started powerlifting in 2017. I did my first meet, a local meet, um, which actually turned out I was a pretty good powerlifter and I qualified for nationals. So I, after that, I continued to, to, to lift and sorry, I'm going to back up a little bit. I guess I'm kind of being wordy. Sorry. Mm -hmm. I'll pause. Um, I started to realize most of all that my suicidal thoughts all but disappeared, um, which I've had my whole life as far back as I can remember. Um, I can remember being in middle school, thinking about suicide, high school, all through college. Um, and I did have a suicide attempt uh, in my early forties. Mm. So I didn't really put that connection together until I was pretty deep into powerlifting. So at that point, I kind of realized there must be this other group of people. It can't just be me who could use this as an outlet. Talk therapy didn't work for me. Um, I had tried meditation, lots of different things, but nothing worked for me like powerlifting did. Um, so, and I did find that a, there was a lot of people in this community that were the same. Um, the, my board members as a perfect example. Um, I have one board member who was a survivor of the Aurora theater shooting here. Uh, she found powerlifting as a way to deal with her trauma. Um, I have a board member who was a victim of sexual assault, which led to anorexia. Um, she found powerlifting and it has helped her. My other board member is a, a victim of domestic violence. So all, all of us have had trauma coming from different sources, um, but you know, trauma nonetheless. So um, I founded the organization based off of that, like hoping to find a group of people like ourselves that maybe didn't even know that this outlet existed. So my goal is to introduce them to something they may not even have known and you know, they need. Yeah. So, so can you tell me a little bit about how you're actually achieving that goal by engaging other people into this, into your organization or into your, uh, you know, idea? Uh, um, up until this point, uh, I have done fundraisers, local fundraisers, usually where we'll do lifting, like a fun lifting competition. Uh, people can donate to the actual lifters, the lifters themselves donate. Um, whatever we raise from that, I use to distribute gym memberships, uh, training to individuals. So I will, I usually start with a three month membership. Uh, so they, that's a good amount of time to, they'll either realize they, it works for them or maybe realize that it doesn't work for them. Um, which is fine. My goal is again, just to kind of lead the horse to water and hopefully introduce it to them. Um, I've gotten about, I want to say about 50 to 60 gym memberships for people thus far. Um, we are looking to fund a, a gym, an actual brick and mortar location, and are also in the process of building a mobile gym, which would give people the ability who don't have access to a gym, whether that be financially or they just physically cannot get to a gym, um, we could actually bring that gym to them or work with uh, work with school systems, identifying maybe a group of students who maybe 
maybe going through some sort of trauma um, that we could actually go to the school and demonstrate and see if there is an interest there. Mm -hmm. um, but also there's a large amount of people who are just scared to go to a gym um, because of, you know, starting out is scary and they don't want to almost embarrass themselves because they may not know anything. So I talked to a lot of people who say that's an obstacle for them. They don't want to go into a huge public gym, which, you know, in could possibly read, lead to ridicule. Um, there's also people that have trauma, like my board member, who cannot be in a space that large uh, due to, you know, her trauma of being in the, in the shooting. Mm. So that allows us to maybe go to people who have that going on and and we can just have this mobile gym that's fully equipped with everything that we would need to to help that person right right that mobile gym idea sounds really very intriguing and and uh, yeah i wish i wish you really luck with that because there's just so much need out there especially in certain communities where access to gym uh, may not be there and if it's there it may be unaffordable or unreachable exactly yeah can you tell me a little bit about the time frame between uh, when you really started, you know, lifting and really when you think that the suicidal thoughts or uh, other stress related issues have really sort of vanished or changed or attenuated? The best I can describe it is powerlifting. Powerlifting, first of all, demands that you nourish your body in a certain way. And I think there's a direct, uh, a direct, what's the word I'm looking for? Correlation okay. between eating well and mental health. Um, so you can't just go into the gym and deadlift a heavy, a heavy deadlift if you have nothing in your body. So it sort of demands that you eat well, um, it demands that you take care of your body, it, it demands that you recover correctly. So there's a series of things that must happen for, for your lift to happen. Um, that, you know, getting eating under control, I was never like a terrible eater, but I definitely wasn't someone who watched what I was eating on the regular, um, which I do now to this day, it's been a process of 14 years now that I've been lifting and it's my lifestyle now and it, it directly affects my mental health. Mm -hmm. um, so I think um, one of the other things about powerlifting is it's a, it's a very solitary sport. However, you do, you need help um, from the community, you need trainers, you need, uh, often need spotters and, and people to help you in the gym, mm. but it's a very personal goal oriented sport. So you might, I'll, I'll use my bench. I'm a bencher. Anybody who knows me knows that bench is my jam. I love bench, um, which a lot of women don't. So I kind of stand out in that way. Mm. Um, my goal when I first started powerlifting, I think my very first meet, um, I benched a hundred and I want to say 138 pounds. So that was in 2017. So, you know, fast forward five years, um, my last bench was 204. So it may not seem like that's a, you know, five years, like you put five years into putting you know, 65 pounds on your bench doesn't sound like a lot, but in powerlifting it is. And if you would have told me I was going to bench over 200 at some point, I would have said no way. Mm -hmm. So it's taught me patience. It's taught me that you have to follow, you have to, you have to follow this process in order to get there. It doesn't happen overnight. So that translates into a lot of other aspects of my life where maybe I didn't have patience before. It allows me to slow down and and think about things differently in my entire life because of that. Mm -hmm. So 
That's really that's really a very interesting comment. I, I really like that because I remember in my early years of running, it was uh, it was uh, very uh, challenging not to focus on what the run is all about, and 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 it was like I was thinking, okay, I have to be done in thirty minutes instead of well, really trying to enjoy the experience and try to make every step of the way is really something that I put my mind into it and it was not up, in, up until I got to that point where running has become such an integral part of my life that now it's almost like a pill I, I have to, if I go a few days that I don't have a run it's like wait a minute what, what am I missing here okay yeah I, I'm missing that because when I go out to run today my target is not to get to the end point my target to enjoy the process. The process of it. Think, think about think about my how my feet feels and how my back feels and how my arms feels along the way and then just sort of completely be consumed by the process of doing what I'm doing. And even if I'm listening to music or something like that, it still takes me away from from that. Uh, it's a it's a very very uh, very good point. And I think that when you start exercising like you have with with uh, lifting. Uh, you have to pay more attention to your body and you have to listen to your body more and yeah. be more attentive. And, and I think to some extent you become more caring about it. Very and, much so. And it's like, it becomes like, I, you know, I won't do anything that it would hurt it. I won't do anything that it really, you know, disturb my, my health, like smoking or drinking or, yeah. or eating unhealthy food. Suddenly it became so unpalatable that doing any of it sort of developed like a guilt feeling what did yeah, i so <laughs> why did i eat that fatty burger i really didn't need that you know, yeah I'm, i mean um you know back if i think back to my 20s 30s and actually like close to my 40s um i was a heavy drinker and i definitely was dealing with my trauma through that and uh, it, it made me miserable. I was, I was depressed every day after I would drink. Um, I would literally sit in bed all day, um, eat terrible, which led to this whole cycle of just repeating in itself. And I mean, now if I even go to a wedding, it's, I have to almost talk myself into having a drink because I don't want to feel like I did ever again. And it's a slippery slope. Um, I mm. think so I just don't even go down that road anymore. Um, but lifting allowed me to, that's how I got out of it because I, if I was doing this competition and I had to do that lift, like there's no skipping in this process. You, you know, it's a very, it's a very regulated program that you follow day to day. And if I went out and did something and I had to lift the next day, I was going to be junk. And so I wanted that goal. I wanted that bench. I wanted that. So it was a personal goal of mine. And I wasn't, I stopped doing all those things that would hinder me from getting there in that process. Uh, let me ask you for a novice like me who really um, don't quite know what lifting is. Here uh, I, am. I mean, I am, I am, I have in my basement, I have a treadmill and a, <laughs> and, a, and, a, and, a and a bicycle and, uh, and I have a free weights and I use my free weights uh, mostly for a little repetition here and there. Uh, how do I start lifting? <laughs> how do you start powerlifting? Oh, um, well, powerlifting is uh, what do I at need? our. What do I need? And how do I go about doing it? What What do you need? I need I need a bench. You need a bench, yeah. You need uh, most people have a rack, uh, so to squat in a rack, which would have safeties, um, everything. You'd need a bar, a couple of barbells. There's there are different barbells for each lift. Uh, squat has a a different barbell than deadlift. Uh, so you don't have to use those. Like you can go to a gym. I train at a commercial gym every now and then I do have a, a gym in, in the basement. 
um, which is actually a really legit powerlifting gym. We have just about everything we need down there, um, including specialty bars and and everything like that. Uh, but I do occasionally go to commercial gyms and and do my big lifts there. Um, right. But you don't really need a lot for powerlifting. It's a pretty you can get flashy and you can do programs that you use chains and bands and all kinds of different things. But the core of powerlifting is pretty simple. We, we perform squat, bench and deadlift. And uh, there's different programs and there's different ways to get there. There's no one right way to, to train for a meet. Um, I've trained probably four or five different programs. I'm just more of like use myself as a guinea pig. I like to try different things to see what works for me. Uh, what works for me may not work for somebody else. Um, but I have found that every program that I've used has still allowed me to uh, better myself. So I just, you know, I find it interesting to try different approaches. But the basics are you need some weights. You need a barbell and a bench. That's about okay. it. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe maybe when this interview is over, you can send us some pictures. Oh yeah. Of, of your of your basement. And oh, for sure. Yeah. What you have down there, and then maybe we can post that at the. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a little video of. Uh, so, yeah, of yeah. We so we can we can incorporate that. All right, that sounds good. Um, you know. Uh, let me let me uh, talk to you a little bit more about some of your board members and the experiences that they have. I'm assuming that they all have found the same uh, benefits of of what you have actually benefited from. You know, with weightlifting, did they do anything else? Is that primarily because I remember seeing one who was interviewed and she was more. Uh, uh, she was, she was, I, th I can't believe, but I think, I, I don't remember, but I believe she was a bodybuilder as well. Is that correct or no? Um, no, no. well, um, uh, Amanda, who's my vice president, who is a, she's also a powerlifter now. I believe that she also did one bodybuilding show. I did one. She did one. Um, Amy is, Amy was, um, a trapeze artist like a dancer I'm probably going to get that wrong so I better ask her exactly what she was but uh, I want to say she was actually in Cirque Soleil for a while so she was more along those lines uh, she started powerlifting to increase her her strength for that and found that it it was uh, something much more than she thought it would be so she still is a powerlifter now she's very tiny and very mighty. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. You know, I'm looking, you're in your kitchen, I'm assuming. I, I am. <laughs> and, and, I, and I'm wondering, uh, I, I know quite a few people that I see in the gym and uh, and they often drink protein shakes and things like that. Do you, do you actually uh, change your diet? I mean, do you really need to maintain a high protein diet for the type of uh, workout that you do uh, yeah I um, again have tried many different diets uh, I think early in my early in my uh, lifting career I did do a lot of protein shakes and like uh, amino acids you know things like that supplements um, I don't anymore I try to eat whole foods I try and stay away from anything that's processed as far as that goes uh I eat a lot of carbs, uh, which most people think that I don't eat any carbs. I think there's this assumption that if you're muscular and lean, you definitely cut down on your carbs. Um, not the case for my body. I eat, I found that when I started, uh, started giving my body carbs and not depriving of it, that's when my muscles started to grow. And that's when my strength really grew, which also is, uh, you know, back to, powerlifting demanding that you give your body these things in order for it to perform right. so I don't you know you can't I'm sure some people do eat a lot less carbs and are and and function and perform well it doesn't work for me so okay you know that sounds good let me ask you a question though that has to deal with uh you talked about 138 pounds 
going up to 204 pounds. I mean, for a lot of people, 138 pounds might seem like a lot of weight. Uh, is 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 any kind of workout in lifting really, I mean, like, you know, you can run one mile, you can run two miles, you can walk one mile, you can walk two miles, you can run a marathon. So, I mean, you can, there's a scalable part of working out. With the lifting, do you see that scale also taking place? And do you see that scale being still beneficial, even at the lower end of the spectrum? Uh, definitely, it's beneficial. I mean, most people, most women who I've helped to start in powerlifting, and I'm talking like people that have no, no background in it whatsoever, uh, usually can do more than they think they can do that that's 99.9% .9 of the case if i were to ask you for example what do you think you could bench you know right off the bat i don't know i play say <laughs> 50 pounds maybe no see i bet you could do at least 125 so oh, there's a yeah uh, like with uh, with uh, like <laughs> you got to come over to the home gym and we'll get you benching. Oh, yeah. um, but I think one, you know, like most people will say I can do the bar, which is 45 pounds. And so what I try to do is set them up um, that, you know, there's definitely bench is a very technical lift. Um, mm -hmm. If you're in, I'm not talking bench just in the, in a gym, if you're just benching just to bench, but when you're competing, it's a very technical lift. There's things that you have to, abide rules than that you have to abide by in the competition so you know we try and train for that immediately if that's your goal to compete it's best to start out with correct form correct uh commands and things like that so you know what you're what you're doing so most people i think get there and they do the bar and they are amazed that they were that it, they were strong enough and it may have even been very easy for them. So we slowly add weight and let them like PR and find what their, what their max rep is. And that's usually what you train off of. You train for a max rep or you, you find your max rep and then you train off of that max rep for the competition. So it, most people are very amazed with themselves at how much they can lift. And it's a very, it's a big mental connection as well. Thinking that you can do it is much better than thinking you can't do it. So if you just, if you just put your mind to, I can do this. Every time I get under the bar, I don't think I can't do this. Mm -hmm. I think I can do this. And sometimes I get it, sometimes I don't, but I don't, before I even do it, I don't put that out there. I just think I can do it. Um, so... I think we can all do more than what we think we can. Uh, Definitely. I remember during the 550-50 that we had in person in 2018, 2019, I remember many, many times when I would be out there running and I would come across someone who was really struggling in their mile from the finish line. And I say, let's run together. And I would just build on the, on the pace and that person is running. And I would sort of slowly try to speed it up with them just a little bit. And it's amazing how they cross the finish line and they are totally fine and they're celebrating. And it's just, it, 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 it's amazing what you can do. Uh, it is. Really set your heart and mind into it. Um, I agree. Well, uh, exercise of all kind activity of all kind is really important for mental health and you're really living proof of that. And I like to think that I am as well, because like you, I suffered from mental health issues primarily in the form of anxiety and panic disorders. And, uh, you know, I realize now that it has probably been in my life for many, many years since my early childhood. But when I had my big panic attack in my late 30s, uh, I had always been a runner, but it wasn't really competitive running. I was more of a, you know, uh, didn't do anything competitively. But when I had that panic attack, I decided to become a competitive runner. And I ran many marathons and 5Ks and 10Ks and half a marathons. And it's my life was transformed after that. 
because so much of my panic attack was centered around my heart, running was a full proof that my heart is okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, and, you know, so as a result, you know, it, it became part of my life. And I, I, that's sort of when I established a foundation, that was my, my, my focus. I, I found weightlifting to be somewhat challenging and difficult, but anybody who starts running or walking, they would probably feel the same way. I was just about to say, I find running very challenging. I, I, um, I, I, did, I did run for a portion of my life, like maybe in my 30s, I, I ran, but it was more like I would do like two or three miles a day. It wasn't anything like that. But that also helped me as well. Um, I do I do very little cardio. I am a, I work in a restaurant, so I am, I am walking for eight hours a day. So I do like cardio in the sense of that. I like to, I like to like say I do cardio, but I, I don't, uh, I don't run or, or things like that anymore. Um, you know, that, another thing, another thing with powerlifting is you do want to hold on to as much muscle as you can. So um, my body has a tendency to, if I were to do a lot of cardio, I would, I would lean out to a point where I would, I would lose muscle mass. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't do a lot of cardio, but, mm -hmm. but it's still good for you. <laughs> it's just not good for me. Yeah, um, yeah. But I actually, um, along the lines of uh, your heart and your panic attacks, um, I kind of had, a, had a reverse uh, situation. So I also have had anxiety my whole life um, and did have some panic attacks. I've only had a few, but they're they're debilitating. So to anybody who has never had one and they can't understand what a true panic attack is, you literally feel like you're dying. Oh yeah. Um, and it's uh it's very scary. Um, but I found very late in life that I had, I did have a heart condition. So I had a Wolf Parkinson white, which is a, oh, wow. oh, yeah. Yeah, oh yeah, you're a doctor, you know what that is. So okay. I, I had Wolf Parkinson white and I had five accessory pathways. So um, I had an ablation, you know, leading up to that, I started passing out. Um, and so I had an ablation once they figured out what was wrong with me, um, a very long process. I was awake for that surgery five hours. And, um, you know, in hindsight, now that my heart beats normally, I can't believe that I didn't know that I had something wrong with me. Um, I mean, I was at my heart rate when they put the monitor on me to figure out what was wrong was in one day went from 22 beats a minute to 175 that was my range wow. so you know they were a little dumbfounded that I was still alive at 40 with this condition going unnoticed um so actually after that I my my anxiety did relieve a little bit um I think that my heart constantly in that state of you know panic almost like beating irregularly my whole life also contributed to my anxiety so uh, that also after after the ablation did help relieve some of my anxiety not all of it but but some of it yeah yeah but well, let's talk a little bit about how exercise of any kind really uh, helps uh, or activity helps our brain uh, you know, I think you and I talked a little bit before this interview about how uh, the muscle, there's a muscle brain connection. And, and it really turns out that that when the muscle contracts due to movement, uh, it, it actually releases compound that goes directly across the blood brain barrier into the brain and activate bone cell growth. Uh, the the compound called brain growth factors, and and these uh, factors uh, are really important for us to maintain our uh, uh, the function of our brain. Uh, it actually almost like throwing Miracle Grow that you put in your yard to grow your grass to put it in your brain so your brain cell can grow. Okay, you know so so. That's really what has been exciting about this. And it's been shown over and over in animal studies and in, in many human uh, studies that really 
uh, activity, uh, especially in the form of regular exercise, does um, is is very helpful in maintaining uh, brain cell activities and actually stimulating brain cell growth. Uh, you know, unlike so many other things that has always been promoted as helpful to our brain, things like having a beer a day or a glass of wine <laughs> a day or or, or or something like that, you know, or, you know, nuts or, I mean, all, you know, of course, everything might be of help, but I've always uh, found that it's interesting that the, when there are thousands of studies out there that supports the role of physical activity in our brain and brain function uh, across animals and humans, you know, there are a handful of studies that shows something else that we really like to enjoy doing, uh, uh, somehow has more popularity and more interest from a general public than things that have really been proven scientifically. And I think that's the challenge that I have in my message across the people and say, you know what, exercise is the best pill. Yes. Um, I actually was having a conversation with Amy, one of my board members the other day, um, and we were talking about how it's interesting that there's been this really big push in our society lately to focus on our mental health, um, to do things that help our mind. And it's always just, you know, meditation, like different things, you know, you name it, but really focus on your mental health. And there's less talk about how you should focus on your physical health in order for that to help your mental health. Um, where it's it's proven that physical activity helps your mental health. If you're just doing the mental health part and not the activity, wouldn't that wouldn't that suggest that you're not doing enough for your mental health? And so, like the the correlation between them is astounding to me. Um, and I would like to see more of that talk about how you really do need that that added thing you can't just go to therapy and talk about it your your body needs to connect with what your mind is doing mm -hmm. yeah absolutely 100 agree yeah i mean i i know there are some therapy right now that are taking place on the outside they call them outdoor therapy where people actually are getting mental health therapy while while walking with their therapist or or something like yeah. that yeah it, that that's uh, that's definitely uh, very important. And I, I really love your message. This is so much synchronized with our message across that just focusing on your mental health is just not enough. You really no. have to focus on your physical health and they have to be, you know, go hand in hand. Now, for someone really that want to know more about your organizations and more about what are you up to and how they can benefit from your experience, can you share your uh, information, your contact information? Sure. Uh, you can go to our website, which is uh, pullyourheartout.org. Um, there will be, there's a, a form on there that you can fill out and it will email me directly and I will respond to you immediately. Um, other than that, yeah, just reach out. We'd be happy to talk to anybody. Um, I, I, I have gotten some messages recently where people are interested in kind of doing the same thing that we're doing in other places in the country. And I'm so for that. I, I hope that what we're doing catches on and people start doing it everywhere. I, I, you know, we never wanted to be the only ones doing this. We want this to be an inspiration for other people to do the same thing. So Christina Leonetti, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much. I, I love what you're doing. Uh, thank you. I, I strongly support you and, and hope that more and more people out there listen to those messages that you just came across. Well, for all of you who are watching us today, I really thank you. And, and I hope that we were able to provide you with some helpful information and helpful knowledge. Uh, well, for those of you who really have been a supportive of us, uh, I thank you very much. For those who are still wanting to, uh, it's easy. It's abkf.org. We love your support so we can keep these messages across to all of you and we can continue to do the things that we do to help all of those adult and children 
with ill mental health to make their life a better place for them. Many thanks, and I look forward to seeing you again.